All right. Okay. So good morning, everybody. Welcome this Saturday morning to our Wake Up With Wildlife for March. Right? Okay. Yeah, we're in March. Um, my name is Carly Padilla. I am the Education Specialist for Project Wildlife, and I am so excited for our presentation today. Um, we have Chase and Rob from the San Diego River Park Foundation, and they're going to share a ton of information with us about some of our local animals that we have uh, right here in our backyard of San Diego. So I'm going to stop talking and give it away to you guys. And um, just real quick, little uh, housekeeping. If you guys do have any questions for Rob or Chase, please go ahead and throw them into the Q&A, um, and then we can get to them um, during the presentation or we'll get to them after the presentation. So thank you, gentlemen, for joining us this morning. We'll let you take it away. Thanks, Carly. Um, I'm Rob, and as Carly mentioned, and I, at first I just want to stop and say thanks to Carly and Project Wildlife. You know, they have been outstanding partners with us for a very, very long time, and you know, we, we so appreciate all that you do, and I, I imagine, you know, the critters appreciate it too, right? Um, as one of the founders of the San Diego River Park Foundation, um, I get to have an incredible team around me of people and volunteers in particular and staff, and Chase is one of those, so you're in for a real treat today. Uh, Chase will be doing most of the talking. Um, I, I'm here uh, just maybe to answer some questions and um, to fill in some things if, if necessary. So I'll be monitoring the chat maybe and, and trying to respond to your questions as Chase kind of fills things in. When we got started 20 years ago, the San Diego River Park Foundation, we set out to raise awareness about the San Diego River and its biota. That's really what our purpose is. And we wanted to not just be one of those groups that kind of just talked. We wanted to be a group that was about action. And so we took that increased awareness and really tried to change everything about the river, the way we even thought about it. Uh, the river was in a terrible place 20 years ago. Some of you might remember, um, might have some firsthand knowledge about all the trash that was there and just terrible conditions. People were filling in the river. Um, it was the lowest water quality in all of San Diego County. Imagine that. So when you looked at kind of the little critters, the little bugs that lived in the river, when you measured that, the San Diego River was considered at that time to have the worst water quality of any waterway, freshwater waterway in San Diego County. That's a terrible thing. And this is that's what we set out to change. Um, the river was, quite frankly, nearly dead, right? So um, I, um, the, um, but a big part of the river is not just the water, it's the wildlife, as those little bugs measured. And uh, the habitat that that wildlife depended upon was becoming fragmented and lost because of development. It was really at a place where a lot of critters, and arguably the San Diego River is considered the most biodiverse place in San Diego, in the United States anywhere. But the sad part of that story, it also had more species at risk of going extinct than anywhere. Gosh, right, that's terrible. And so that is really what our charge is. Our charge was to take the river, clean it up, uh, care for it, to give it a voice, much like you know, if we could say the Lorax would do for, for trees, we were there, the Lorax of the river. And then to turn that voice and that awareness into doing something about it so critters and the river had a better future. Um, so as I mentioned, I'll, I'll turn it over to Chase in just one minute. I, I wanted to share one little story. As a person that kind of created the Critter Cam program many years ago, it's near and dear to my heart. And I remember early after we started it, uh, I got word that there, somebody had seen a bobcat in Mission Valley. Imagine that, a bobcat, right? And um, so if you know where Marina Boulevard is, not too far from where you, where you guys work, um, uh, you know, sandwiched in between Interstate 8, Interstate 5, Friars Road, there was a bobcat. How did it get there? What was it doing there? Did it have a chance to live? And so we set out some cameras and started to move around. And we actually found that it was going through this little pipe under Interstate 8 into the habitat um, on the other side of the freeway. So Presidio Park, Mission Hills, the canyons, and that's how it was surviving. And we've heard or seen that bobcat over the years, I'm sure maybe a different one, but that is the power of a wildlife camera. Then we turn that into action by using that to advocate when there was a proposal to redesign that pipe so that it would no longer, and actually effectively, it would no longer have the ability to have that bobcat go through it. And so the power of these things is for land acquisition, for raising awareness about some really awesome critters. Um, things, that I, I don't know about Chase, you'll probably talk about this, but it's so often we'll say, we never knew we had those in San Diego. It's like, yeah, we do. And so the images are really help people understand and appreciate not only our wildlife in San Diego, but how it's at risk. And with that, I'll turn it over to Chase. Chase is our senior research coordinator. He runs our Critter Cam program. 
Um, and I'm very, very excited to have Chase here talking about it. Chase, it's all up to you. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Carly, for the introduction. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just as passionate as all of you are about wildlife, and I'm really uh, excited today to to show you some some of the the content we're able to to capture and uh, kind of overview our wildlife camera program and how it's really grown within the last couple of years. So, I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. All right. So yeah. So. Um, our camera traps are key tools to our River Park Foundation's conservation strategy and preserve management and also land acquisition. And so this presentation, what it really will do is overview all of our camera, what, what, it, what our camera program is all about and um, just a lot of great content um, to look at and um, some, some really unique photos. So here's the general setup with our wildlife camera programs. You'll see um, the wildlife camera itself, we have a security cage, a uh, security box around it that keeps it, protects it from weathering and protects it from vandalism or theft. Uh, and then we have a um, Python cable that uh, runs through the security box and attaches to whether a tree or a T-post, um, something that it we stage it on um, along a, a game trail for capturing our wildlife. And then um, an antenna, if if we do, we do have a few cellular cameras, so that which means it's like a phone where it connects to AT&T, 4G, LTE, and can send us photos real time um, the day of or the moment it captures anything that goes by it. So um, those it's a it's a emerging technology that it makes our uh, life a lot easier as um, with with checking the cameras. So. Here's a great, I want to introduce this presentation with a great coyote photo that we just recently got in January, just after some of the weather. Um, just beautiful shot. It, uh, yeah, I just, I think I'll, I can let the picture speaks for itself here. Um, and also bobcats. So we see tons of different wildlife and today you'll see a, a diverse set of photos of all the wildlife that is as using the upper San Diego River um, the, in our watershed. Just, it's uh, like Rob said, it's an amazingly diverse area. And here's a, another close up of a beautiful deer um, just after some rain. So why camera traps? Um, it's part of the part of the reason why we uh, we invest a lot of energy and time into um, our wildlife camera program is telling the story, telling the story of why this why these lands should be protected, why we should um, really emphasize pre preserving wildlife corridors, um, and why we should raise raise. Um, funds for acquiring land and preserving these this land forever. Um, it holds a lot of wildlife and a lot of um, species richness. So along with our camera traps, preserve management as well, um, indicating or identifying uh, trespassing or illegal usage on our preserves, invasive, invasive pests, uh, cows, um, feral pigs. And also documenting species richness. Uh, we, it's it's hard to sit there in a, a newly acquired land and not and and know what what all is using it. And these cameras kind of give us a give us a view and a, give us an insight on really how diverse and how how used these these uh, areas that we are acquiring how how much they get used. Um, and then also, so, um, periodically. Uh, a lot of our camera traps and the things that we capture on the camera, the wildlife can contribute to some of the states and regional studies as I will uh, speak about um, through on this lecture. So here's just a Google map of- uh, Hey Chase, of real quick, I'm sorry. Yeah. Can you talk about the ringtail real quick? <laughs> sure, yeah, but, uh, what uh, is the animal, the ringtail? <laughs> so um, yeah, it's, I believe it is a, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rob, or someone can uh, step in on this, but I believe it's a, uh, a rel relative of the weasel or the raccoon. It was one of the two. Um, they're not very well documented in San Diego County. And um, 
one of my surprises in this lecture was to show our first ever ring tail cap capture um, in on on our cameras and so they're just a very uh, novel species that is really their habitats really hard to um, it's 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 just really hard to document these these uh this this wildlife and um, yeah they're just not not really well known in San. So, so I'll I'll jump in if it's okay, Chase. They're in the raccoon family. Raccoon. Um, they even though people call them ring-tailed cats, they're not cats. Uh, they are super cool, uh, as you can see, and they're really elusive. So we have tried for many many years to capture a ring-tailed cat, uh, and it, and as Chase just mentioned, it was the first time we've captured one. Just gosh, what several months ago now. Uh, and uh, maybe another 15 years before we see one again, but, but they are super cool, aren't they? Yeah, they're amazing. And just to mention, we do have badgers in San Diego too, people. <laughs> yeah. Ba so badgers is actually something I chase. Is this in your presentation later? Should I not? Okay. Uh, it is, but you can, you can speak about it a little bit too. So badgers are, um, they're awesome. And USGS, um, uh, is started to do a study a little while ago. And uh, we have these expansive, you know, properties kind of in uh, target rich areas intentionally, right? Because that's what we've tried to conserve over the years. Things that were at risk of it being developed, being sold. Often these are properties that have been in generationally in a family and somebody, you know, and, uh, gets it and doesn't want it anymore and they want to sell it to somebody for a house. So these are where these critters live often or they use those lands to get from one area in the Cleveland National Forest to the other area in the Cleveland National Forest. And so we jump in, we raise money, as Chase mentions, we buy them. Uh, often what we try to do is kind of put out cameras and get information to tell the story of why we want to buy those and also to guide us to say maybe we don't need to buy it. And um, the badger is a perfect example of that where USGS was doing some studies and we said, we'll jump in and do that. And I'm sure Chase will talk about it more later, but we did capture a badger photo, um, uh, an image um, some time ago now. And and it's been an important part of us, probably of our program now for maybe what, three, four years, I think. So um, yeah, badgers are cool. Uh, <laughs> they're awesome. Uh, I wouldn't want to tangle with one personally, but uh, they're pretty super cool. Chase, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, yeah, we'll get to the badgers and uh, the ringtail cat content uh, later on. I'm saving that the best for last. Um, so moving on here. Uh, let's see. Boom. OK, so our wildlife camera program consists of eight different cameras and it's growing um, on this map. Here is just some of the uh, an aerial view of where seven of the eight cameras are um, are located. And so they're 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 located on um, yeah on these are, these are a few of our property boundaries and um, yeah so it's pretty spread it's it's spread out for the most part um, generally speaking but it's it's uh, um, they these cameras are focused along um, wildlife corridors and different uh, migratory paths for for these some of the wide ranging uh, migratory species. And Chase, let me jump in here. So if everybody, please, please, please do not share this image. <laughs> um, uh, the, the camera locations are uh, near and dear to our heart because people do watch what we do and they're hunters. And they've been known to try to track down using our cameras to go out and uh, chase these critters down. So um, please, uh, I know this is being recorded, but um, you know, don't go out and <laughs> take a picture of this and post it somewhere, please. We would really appreciate it. But this is kind of insider information. We know you guys respect that and and uh, also see value in it. So um, thanks, Jess. Yeah. So um, what do we hope to find with these wildlife uh, these wildlife photos and the content that we're getting? Um, and honestly, we're it, it's 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 a great tool to really get a glimpse into what the wildlife's doing a lot of times these these photos and um these images that we're getting is we're seeing scenes and seeing behavior from wildlife that you know uh usually we might not ever be able to see um in real life if we're hiking or whatever and um it's just you know documenting species the the species that are using our preserves and um also you know after as we post cameras in certain locations for months and months and years, we're able to uh, sometimes identify individuals by their, um, by, by their markings and, uh, 
and um, yeah, more frequent, uh, be able to identify, uh, you know, what uh, wildlife that maybe uses a certain path on a camera for uh, certain months of the year and um, being able to, to identify any behavioral uh, traits and frequencies and uh, consistencies with the wildlife. Um, also, some things that we're, we're hoping to find is to conduct our in-house behavioral analysis. So um, utilizing interns and um, students in academia to uh, run our, the data that we are continually collecting. And we have a huge data set of um, wildlife photos and wildlife um, data. And you know, having some intellectual minds really uh, take that data to the next step, and that also ties into population size of mountain lions or bobcats or badgers or um, coyotes, just seeing seeing um, what is the most uh, frequent pass buyers of our cameras. Um, and what and these photos and you know, piggybacking on uh, the, the, the species, documenting the species of the uh, that are using our preserves, it, it can it can tell tell the story of you know what 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 areas are really uh, connectivity points of habitat and of land, um, and then also uh, one of the other things is just unauthorized uses. Uh, our cameras will will capture that as well, and that can be helpful for future management. So here's just a basic list of uh, a lot of the the different types of species that we've uh, observed over the years. So. Um, it's diverse. It's a it's a long it's a long growing list, and um, our recently uh, newly observed wildlife from last year would be the the ringtail cat, the spotted skunk, and the red shoulder hawk. Uh, believe it or not, we uh, we were able to um, document it on a near a creek. So and then there's a beautiful close up of this nice gray fox here. Um, so here's some uh, some examples of unauthorized uses, uh, and our camera ca captures it, and it's it's useful data to know um, and to uh, take further action if if need be. So you can see, you know, hunters um, uh, going across the camera that's on our property, which is illegal, um, and then you know, unauthorized ATVs or uh, vehicle uses on our on our preserves. And then also another trespasser, uh, Mr. Cow here. So yeah, there, there is cattle, cattle all around um, our adjacent landowners in uh, where our properties are. Uh, most often have cattle, and they come on our property. It's not the the biggest concern. It's not the uh, a very I guess the biggest concern, but it is. You know, it's it's good to to note if um, if a uh, property owner doesn't know that their cattle has been using our property, um, we can just kind of politely notify them that we're seeing them on on a certain location and just, you know, keeping the um, the landowner relationships uh, positive. And then also another invasive pest, uh, the feral pig. So the feral pig, uh, in San Diego County, I've, it, there was a rural infestation of them, and they've done a really good job of uh, eradicating the feral pigs in the in the watershed. Um, and this was captured, and there there was at this time in 2017, there it was known that there was maybe one or two, uh, just a, a very few amount of feral pigs left on um, within the, within the watershed, and uh, we captured it and we were able to forward um, these photos over and the locations of the, this boar and when it's la it's last seen for um, with through the we sent it over to the Forest Service or whoever's doing the, the active management and it is useful data to uh, to to know where it's last last um, has been seen and observed so there's the feral pig and these feral pigs can be very destructive to habitat and uh, yeah they're not not good for good for the landscape um, and so here's a beautiful picture of a deer and uh, it, uh, it's you can kind of see its antlers are uh, in, it's felting right now or it's in felt and uh, um, yeah here's a beautiful bobcat family of deer we just recently uh, captured this uh, 
along a, a game trail of a, a nice family of four. And we've seen these, uh, we've seen a lot of high, a high deer, or freak, a, high, uh, a frequency of deer um, within this location. And um, yeah, so a little, a little family. And believe it or not, our cameras also, this is a first um, captured a bat or yeah, what looks like to be a bat. And um, yeah, I just thought it was a really cool image, unique image that I was not expecting to see when processing these photos. So uh, I wanted to share that as well. Hey, and uh, Chase, if I can jump in. So uh, uh, Chase does a lot of things. And one of the other programs that he manages is our bat conservation program. And so, you know, uh, Critter Cam can be in a lot of different formats. We we have some friends who take incredible bat photos. You, you probably know Don. Maybe some of you may know Don, uh, who's, you know, uh, well regarded throughout uh, the region and beyond. Uh, and we have document. How many is it, Chase, now? 13 or 14 different species of bat at one location. Yeah. Um, and Chase heads up that program as well. So. Uh, and, and we have multiple different locations we're looking at for bat conservation as well. And so all of this kind of links together with that notion that I mentioned of like, what do we do to conserve what we got and make it better, right? And so, um, and target our focused actions to really conserve these incredible species. So Chase, thanks for all you do. Yeah. Um, and here's a, a very, uh, a very uh, gruesome, a uh, photo of a fox with what we believe to be a uh, half of a, a weasel or a um, yeah, it's, it has some type of meal. And it's just uh, another example of, you know, we, I probably will never be able to see this in in person um, of a, a fox with it's a half a half uh, mangled meal. And um, so I, I just think these these uh, these photos hold a lot more richness than just what what we're seeing. Um, so, so, you know, one of our uh, charismatic species in our watershed is the mountain lion, definitely. And um, there has been a lot of research work uh, getting, you know, more familiar and a, a better understanding of what, um, what our mountain lion population looks like in San Diego County and also its movement and its migrational paths. So um, what these cameras have helped with is uh, is really, you know, capturing, uh, contributing to uh, overall studies. And uh, this, this, uh, these photos here are of a collared lion back in uh, 2016, 2017, uh, named M125, and it was uh, he was a part. The the male mountain lion was a part of an overall study done by. Uh, Winston Vickers and Justin Dellinger with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, and they're they're collaring mountain lions and um, yeah, uh, gathering the data from their 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 migrations and um, and so you know we our cameras captured this mount this mountain lion here and we were able to you know contribute and communicate with the researchers saying hey here's some photos of the mountain lion for them to see them to see. And also, uh, um, yeah, to um, yeah to communicate with them and contribute some data to their to their overall research. So that um, that was really uh, important, and we really uh, gravitated towards M twenty five during this time, and it was a a, a really um, exciting time for for the the River Park Foundation. Yeah, and uh, let me let me jump in there a little bit. Uh, this was near and dear to my heart, so I worked on this quite a bit. Um, and a little bit before Chase's time. Um, and M125, uh, you can see that big collar. People have a lot of questions about those collars. Those are designed to fall off at a certain point. They're also designed to kind of expand as a critter grows. Um, and um, this one in particular, M125, was the last one to survive of the, um, the, the population that was collared. And so when actually the collar had actually no longer worked, we were able to provide data to the researcher uh, because this this guy <laughs> crossed three different cameras that we had, three different locations. And so it was actually incredibly powerful. And then we used that data to actually join in the efforts to conserve cougars. Um, there was some recent legislation and some actions by the state to further protection, protect them. And so we were very actively involved with that, using the critter cam data as kind of our driving force 
Um, just to think about it, the rough number, nobody really knows. There's about 90, more or less, based upon population density studies, uh, cougars in the eastern part of San Diego County in the peninsular population, which is considered a unique subpopulation of cougars. And so, uh, sadly, M125 was killed um, in Ramona. Um, and um, again, you know, that we use that energy to actually further protect the cougars and work with many partners to do that. Project Wildlife may have been involved, I don't know, but um, gosh, uh, M125 um, is near and dear to my heart for sure. And I was really sad uh, the day it was shot and killed. So um, Chase, back to you, sorry. Yeah, um, and so here's uh, courtesy of Winston, one of the researchers, Winston Victor, uh, pictures. Um, this was you know, some of the, this is the data that they're collecting of, um, the caller was, this is how, it, this is where really the caller came into play was taking uh, GPS data points of, um, yeah, it's movement. And so you can see um, Lakeside, uh, you see El Capitan Reservoir here um, in El Cajon Mountain, and then all the way up to further up in the watershed. Um, but yeah, so here's some, some other photos of M25 and uh, yeah, using, using our preserve and, um, yeah, really. Chase, Chase, can you go back a slide? Because there's a, a little point. If you look at the red, those are some of our properties. And so you can see, and this is an incredible diverse area from the, the, the red one that's kind of like a square in the middle on the left, that's El Cajon Mountain. And so we own much of El Cajon Mountain. And so we had a camera up there that actually captured M125. The one down below um, is uh, what's called Pitts Creek or Chocolati Creek. Um, again, we didn't capture it there, but but it, you could see it was going through our property. And then on the on the toward the upper right, you can see the location of what we call Eagle Peak Rant or Eagle Peak Preserve. Uh, and uh, while it the little green dots don't show on there specifically, we definitely documented it there. So um, you can see the range. I mean, the, this this dude was going all the way over to Ramona, pass into Poway, all the way up to Lake Cuyamaca. That's how big of a range it had. And so. Those little connections between big pieces and big pieces, those little connections are so vital because if they can't get from here to there, then you can't have the genetic mixing of that's essential for the health of this critter, uh, the species, right? And so we don't want to lose our subpopulation. And so this was something near and dear to our heart was how can we play a role to ensure that this top predator can be part of a healthy ecosystem forever? And um, that's what we do. And so I... Uh, I love the cougars. I, I probably talked about them way too much, but I apologize for that. So, Chase. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, these 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 critters have huge migra migratory ra ranges, and um, that's why you know it's important to us to really preserve, per purchase, and preserve in uh, wildlife corridors, and uh, really is keeping that connectivity of public lands and conserved lands. Um, keeping that, uh, you know, protected. So yeah, here's another another uh, photo set of the M125 passing by a camera in 2017. Um, and yeah, so M25 unfortunately was uh, killed, but we have a new caller uh, mountain lion as of early, late last year, M254. And M254 was is a part of um, a collaring study done uh, at the beginning of uh, 2020 by the same researchers, Winston Vickers and Justin Dellinger. And so again, we have another, um, another mountain lion to root for and, um, to, to kind of sit and watch and, uh, yeah, watch him go on. So here's some beautiful images, crisp images of that collar, um, of the mountain lion. Chase, we just have a quick question about um, the killing of M125. Uh, is it illegal to hunt mountain lions? Yes, it's illegal to hunt mountain lions. Um, there's a three, and Rob probably can speak on this better, but um, there's a three strike policy, I think. Uh, yeah, uh, Rob, how about you go ahead? And <laughs> sure, get... so the rules have changed just in the past year. And again, we were, uh, um, you know, a, a, a member of that effort, not the leader on it for sure, but a member of it. So there, there used to be a kind of a dividing line at roughly uh, Ramona, 
so south of Ramona to the border, they weren't as protected. Now, mountain lions are generally protected by California law that was passed by the, um, the voters, right? And that law basically said that you still had the right to take, to kill a mountain lion if you had personal property or you yourself or a family member, you know, people's lives were at risk. And so that was often used where, you know, in the case of M125, it seemed to have a, like to go into this one pen where there was goats or something. And so they, they killed it. Um, and uh, that's not the way it's supposed to be done. And so the rules have changed to tighten that up to say you really just can't do that to take a, a mountain lion anymore. You can still do it, of course, if somebody is, is going to be personally harmed. And there's some other exceptions. Um, but there's this three strike law that Chase was talking about. But before that, that wasn't, wasn't the case. That's a great question. And somebody asked just in the, in the uh, question and answer, what's the range of a cougar? Uh, it, the, the females are, uh, Chase, I forget the exact numbers, maybe 80 square miles, roughly. The males are much bigger than that, like 140, 150, 160. I forget the exact number, but it's, it's a very expansive area. And you think about why. So there's not that many of these, just 90 kind of in the peninsula range. And that's a, an estimate. In order to have the genetic diversity, they really need to be moving around a lot. And um, males do not like to be in the same territory. Think about that, right? They'll fight. And so they, they, they don't kind of overlap. So you have to have these expansive areas where they can kind of move around and go find females at the right time of year um, so that they can, you know, further the population, as we might say. So um, uh, that that range is really, really significant. And as we see kind of the tightening of that range where, you know, houses are being built, roads are being built, whatever's being built, vineyards are being built those things all of a sudden start to come into the property, the range of those critters, and they have to choose whether they can find another place to go or try to live with that. And so we see those conflicts, right, all the time. We also see places like a Penasquitas Canyon where, yeah, there's mountain lions there. Mission Trails, yeah, there's mountain lion. Well, a mountain lion or two. And, and at some point, though, they get trapped because they have no place to go because they lose the, the, the connection of land. And mountain lions like riparian areas. Think about that. Why? The, you know, there's very dense vegetation, right? And so they can hang out in there and nobody sees them, nobody cares. Um, and, and they can move to the next area they need to get to. And, and a good old friend of mine, Mike Kelly, some of you may know, Mike once told me, and he's been doing this much longer than me, and I've been doing it a very long time. He once said that, that um, deer don't have a great memory. And so what a mountain lion likes to do is they like to wander long enough that when they come back to a deer population, the deer forgot what they were. So, so, so then they have a better chance of catching a deer. And uh, I, I always thought that was kind of funny, but, but they do have a very, very big range uh, to answer that question. So yeah, it's exci it was exciting to have another collared mountain lion um, using our using our uh, preserve. So uh, so yeah, here's here's another um, image of M uh, two fifty four coming by two different same same property but two different camera locations. So um, some of the so going into some of the challenges that we have with our wildlife camera program is obviously one vandalism um theft shooting our we've had wildlife cameras shot we've had wildlife cameras stolen uh which is unfortunate but um also wind so wind can uh during the summer months and during uh windier times our cameras will get will it will trigger whether a grass is blowing um, within the field of view or a uh, branch comes into the field of view, it will trigger a ton of photos. And so, you know, day after day after day, um, that can, can become a challenge with, uh, with storage, with processing through th tens of thousands of photos. Um, it can be, it can be quite, quite tedious. Um, so, so that being a challenge, and we, we definitely take that into account when we're placing a new wildlife camera in a, in a new location. Um, vegetation too. So, you, you know, wildlife, a lot of times we'll use trails that are open, but um, yeah, fi vegetation, figuring out, you know, where, where a good spot is um, to, to start to document the wildlife there. Um, the remoteness of the locations 
become an, uh, a challenge, can become a challenge um, to, to, to get out to them, um, to, to, to get out to them every four to six weeks uh, is basically is typical, our typical uh, ma uh, maintenance uh, period and equipment malfunctions. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes you're setting up a camera and you forget to turn it on and then you come out four weeks later and it hasn't taken any, any photos. So um, those are just some of the, the challenges that uh, we have been facing with our wildlife camera program. And, uh, you know, San Diego River Park Foundation, we are volunteer led and uh, as well as our wildlife camera program is volunteer run. Um, so we, our needs for, for volunteers are going out to these remote location and checking the wildlife cameras, changing the batteries, changing the memory cards, um, doing any uh, maintenance or trimming around the, the camera that to, 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 um, to minimize a possible huge data set of, uh, of trim triggering our, our camera and also having the, the savviness to, to move a low camera, if, move a camera if we um, need, need to uh, and knowing, you know, knowing what to look for um, when when relocating a camera and then also processing photos and that has been a huge thing that we've made a, a great adjustment in during the pandemic is um getting access creating a platform where volunteers can virtually access these loose data uh photos and from our cameras and categorize them and put them in categories uh, categories for us to then um, do future analysis on. So um, we've been using a Google Drive and it's been a great, great tool that um, has has been a, a very popular thing during the pandemic and during our um, virtual virtual engagement. So here's just a, some of our, uh, I just wanted to share a some photos of our current volunteers that are checking our cameras. We have, uh, you can see Shankar and his daughter checking one of the cameras. Uh, one of our volunteers, he's checking with his daughter, um, our camera. Um, we have Mystery on the right-hand side that checks a, a series of cameras too. So um, you can see she's putting a camera on a tree up in the top right corner. And then at the below, she uses a camera to, uh, put the same SD card in to, to make sure the, the, um, the angle of the cameras at a, at a good, good angle for, for photos and also checking to see if, uh, quickly see if the, the angle beforehand was, um, was good. And then we have Tim in the, uh, the bottom left crouching down. And that's, that's something, uh, I like to train, um, our volunteers who are checking the camera and having to, um, reposition it after they check it after they take it apart and replace all this do the general maintenance um i have them really crouch down and crouch down to uh to be to be an animal and um see you know look at the camera see the angle see the downward trajectory to get that that great shot of the, of the wildlife in the middle of the photo and get really good quality photos so that that's tim there he's um crouching down and just making sure that he uh he gets a good angle for for the next series of photos that will be coming. Um, so another thing I, I love to share, and this is what's great about wildlife camera uh, wildlife cameras, is that you can you can see comparisons with uh, male and females, or even just uh, a species to species. You can you can see how um, the size difference uh, is is very very dramatic with the male mountain lion and the female mountain lion. Um, and so that that's something that is another fun tool to use with these with these cameras. And here is a, a gorgeous shot of a uh, mountain lion we caught in last last uh, December, just a couple months ago. Um, beautiful shot of uh, this mountain lion, first mountain lion um, that we captured in this area. Um, so it was really exciting to see, and yeah, just. I mean, beautiful perspective, just close up images on um, this wildlife is something that, you know, I don't know if I'll ever be able to see in person, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite beautiful. And you can really see the dramatic length of that, that tail there of the mountain lion. So here's another series of shots of um, mountain lion, uh, a mountain lion mother with her two cubs back in 2019. 
coming by the camera. And then here's some more. And so yeah, young, 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 young mountain lions, juvenile mountain lions from year zero to one, they'll 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 have these the the these dots, these markings on their on their fur as they're beginning to um, mature. And uh, this camera captured a great great photo of three of them still with their with their patterns before they move on to a um, a, a single color of brown and yeah so here's another another great photo of mountain lion and you can just really see the the musk the muscles and the the strength that these these cougars really have in the neck and the shoulders um it's they're they're vicious beautiful but very vicious animals <laughs> Here's another one. Hey Chase, can I jump in for a second? These are, mountain lions are cool. Uh, if you did notice, just to point out the obvious perhaps, if you look down at the bottom of these images, you'll see the time stamps and the date stamps. Um, the temperature reading, sometimes not accurate, um, just because often it's right directly in the sun and, and it, it gets a little overheated. But um, that information, the battery life, all of those sort of things are really useful for Chase and his team as they manage these as well. It also gets into a question which I just saw, which is, is this a road or what, what is this? So wildlife uses trails of all different sites, whether it's a, a game trail or it's a people trail. And um, we have found, right, Chase, that they like trails. It's amazing, right? And so then you get into this land management um, issue of, gosh, if you know that bobcats and lions and whatever species are there at a certain time of day, is that an appropriate time for people to be using that trail? Yeah, it's a good management question. So those are those are the sort of things that we again take a look at. Um, but I have to tell you, in 20 years of doing this, as far as I know, uh, no one has ever seen a mountain lion on one of our properties. Um, but we know they're there, right? So the lions are really good in particular of, of kind of getting around you. And I don't know about you, but I've been out there many times where I've felt a presence. And I felt like there was something watching me. Um, and I, I hope that I'd love to see a cougar one day from a safe distance, of course. But um, gosh, that would be a great day for me. Um, but uh, just to kind of let you know, it's, it's interesting, all of these images, because we have found, I have found, doing this for a very long time, that these critters like trails of any sort. And um, that's fascinating to me because we also want to think about where we create trails because if they follow a trail to a bad location, that also could be really bad, like a road or something like that. Sorry, Chase. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. That's that's something, you know, as I've um, worked with this wildlife camera program and um, just, you know, looking when I'm on on trails hiking, uh, looking at the tracks on the ground, the, the wildlife, they, yeah, they love to use the trail just as much as we do. And it's open. Uh, it's They don't have to bushwhack per se through thick hardy cenothus or chaparral they you know if they can um get to one point to the other uh efficiently they it seems that they yeah they they love to share the trails with us so here's a here's a beautiful image of a coyote and you can see um its trail of uh print it's prints in the snow um behind it um back in 2019 so it's just a great photo and also, you know, I was at uh, beginning of the the, the lecture, I kind of said that we get, you know, these wildlife cameras, um, they give us a chance to really view um, some odd behaviors of wildlife that usually um, we're not able to see and we're only able to know that this happens through these remote cameras. And here's a bobcat um, rolling around in uh, an exposed patch of, uh, of dirt. And um, I guess, you know, we, we, we started to see these on uh, in front of a couple different cameras uh, that um, the scent gland, there's uh, the bobcats have uh, scent glands on on their neck or there is a scent on the, the dirt that they want to rub into themselves. Um, but just super cute. It looks like a cat that your house cat that you just want to go cuddle. Um, but it's just these amazing images of um, of, yeah, these critters and this bobcat in in particular. So that was just a, a cool sequence of photos that I wanted to share. 
Um, another really cool uh, image that uh, we hadn't really captured before on, or uh, uh, we haven't ca captured this critter before um, on any of our cameras, but this is a, a, a spotted skunk. You can kind of see it's a little blurry. Uh, you have We have some uh, infrared blur, but um, you can see that uh, with a really like kind of real spiky tail, uh, this is a spotted skunk. So um, you can see now see the spots at the bottom of the screen um, and that big uh, spiky tail. Um, but yeah, just, I mean, the, they're, 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 they're common in uh, San Diego County, but just um, it was a first for us on our camera back um, early, early last year. Hey, Chase, do you want to like point to it just in case nobody sees what you're talking about? Yeah. So uh, bottom of the screen, middle, here's my cursor around here. I'll go back to the first one, but yeah. So it was following something. We, um, unfortunately the, the photos before didn't capture what, what this, um, what to the right of it was, but so that's a mystery that sometimes we have mysteries in our, in these photos that we can never get the answer to, but yeah. So there's the spots there. Beautiful, beautiful critter. Um, and then Roadrunner, just, you know, some, some unique, unique photos that I, they come out really good. And, um, yeah, just, it's, it's great to, great to see the, the diversity. It's not just mammals and mountain lions and bobcats and foxes. We also capture, you know, great, great images of birds too. And, um, this is a Roadrunner with its, you can kind of see its mohawk, its black mohawk on top on the top of its head there and then here's another uh bird of prey uh red red shoulder hawk that uh we a red shouldered hawk that we uh, captured um on one of our creek uh crossing cams um getting some uh i guess getting some water uh it's it's crouching down and um sipping on the creek so yeah just another you know unique Great image, clear image, close up of a, um, yeah, a beautiful hawk. And so, yeah, as we talked about uh, earlier, we uh, we were able to really document our. We had this huge, um, a, our a great documentation of uh, an active badger uh, burrow, and we staged a camera in front of it and captured captured some really great images of. Um, these elusive animals, American badger, uh, and and this these partnerships. So this this photo in particular, you can really see the the facial designs on on the badger. And uh, with USGS, we uh, we you know submitted our data, submitted this data to them, and um, they actually were are developing and I think have developed a facial recognition software that can. Um, in, uh, can they can recognize individual badgers just based on their facial uh, striping. So, um, yeah, so that that type of partnership and contribution is just really really awesome when uh, with our wildlife camera program. Um, so yeah, here's here's and a little backstory on this on this. So it's really hard. I've I've uh, found out that's really hard to to capture badgers. You got uh, you have to. It's a little bit of luck and a, a little bit. Of, it's a little bit of skill and a lot of luck. Um, uh, the this the keys to success is finding a a burrow that seems to be active and staging a camera right in front of it. And that's what this volunteer did here. Um, and you can see it's kicking up uh, as they are um, phosphoral animals. They uh, they love to dig, and this is a. Uh, is great got a great image of the dirt kicking up in midair of uh um it creating its uh burrow but um yeah they just are really hard to uh document and this volunteer he was just uh checking the camera a camera was sort of in the area and then he found that there was a a very recently dug up burrow that then he moved the camera right away and stuck it stuck it in front of the front of this burrow for um, a three or four day stint just to see if they could capture um, the badgers. And so here's our ringtail cat photo oh, and this a ringtailed cat photo and this was yeah back in uh, December of 2019. Um, but this yeah this you know another great thing about our wildlife camera pro uh, wildlife cameras is that you never know like what you're what you're gonna get and this uh, 
we were really excited about this, this photo of the ringtail cat in the upper left hand corner. You can really see that, um, that striped tail. And this was on top of, yeah, El Cone Mountain, um, very, a very remote section of it. Um, and yeah, it was, you know, we were very, here's, I've circled the, another, the photo of the ringtail cat. Um, so yeah, and we, you know, this, these photos as well, and the look, we disclosed the location, the exact location to um, some, a mammal, the mammalologist and probably the lead researcher of ringtail cats in the area to, of, um, with the San Diego Natural History Museum. So um, yeah, a lot of these, you know, capturing these not well documented uh, wildlife, we, uh, it, it helps contribute, you know, to the overall study and understanding of them. Um, and that's, that's pretty special. And also I had to add this. Uh, so, you know, we, uh, we, we do work closely with Project Wildlife and, um, uh, and if they have, they want to release any raccoons that have been rehabilitated, they love to release them at our preserves. And we, we love that they, that, you know, Project Wildlife wants to, to release them here. So here's actually a photo of, this was this year of a raccoon and we, uh, I'm presuming it, it to be, one of the raccoons that they did release um, um, near Boulder, uh, yeah, near this preserve, um, not in, uh, not too long before this photo was taken, um, and so it's you know it's it's awesome to see that the the raccoons are are uh, coming by and they they also play a significant role in the ecosystem and um, yeah they're they are important. Here's a a cool photo of it. Looks like it's going down. Um, to, to drink some water, but you can really see its, uh, its facial patterns as well. Um, and then another, uh, un another unique scene that I've, I've never seen before on wildlife camera, uh, below the arrow is the same raccoon and it's swimming in the water. Um, and so as I go side, slide by slide, you can see it move across the, wa the, the water's edge. So it's, it's just, you know, awesome. Awesome uh, photo sequence, and um, yeah, so, you know these. We are really appreciative of Project Wildlife um, wanting to release um, raccoons and other wildlife on our preserves. So what's next? Um, some some things that we are kind of targeting and uh, planning for the future is finding a solar power source for um, our cameras. It would be really huge to to step away from our rechargeable double a batteries to something that's self-sufficient so um so we don't we only have to check the cameras when the memory gets full and it can self power itself so i the technology is not not totally there yet but um that's something we're keeping our eye out on for um as we are as our program develops and as we uh move on um crowdsourcing so we we this year, this last year was a huge, um, it has really, uh, uh, we've really, you know, utilized crowdsourcing for our processing of wildlife photos and um, growing that, uh, growing that crowdsourcing, finding um, possibly some, some platforms that uh, the storage, you know, with Google, we use Google Drive right now, but the storage, we, we tend to, to, to build up, uh, to run out of storage very quickly just with the, 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 the data sets that we are uploading. Um, so finding a, finding an alternative uh, platform to do this, uh, to do crowdsourcing, to do photo processing. Um, and then also, you know, growing our cameras. Uh, the more cameras we have on our preserves, um, the more, you know, the more we can understand the, the, the movement of wildlife and the more we can, you know, uh, the further we can identify, um, yeah, areas of importance to possibly go out and acquire land or um, do a do a badger study or uh, any any furthering of our our understanding and our research of our lands um, is uh, it it will it can it all kind of ties back into um, having cameras and having eyes out there and it can identify you know further projects. Um, Video content. Uh, we're starting to uh, we're starting to acquire cameras that have very good video capabilities, um, and so we we would like to get some video content. Um, some of the some of the the 
dilemmas we have with the video content is it does take more battery and it um, it drains the battery quicker and it fills the the memory card um, quicker. So so just you know we're slowly trying to figure that out and maybe scheduling our camera to 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 go beyond the video settings uh, a couple of days before we go out to check the camera so that you know it, we're gonna replace the batteries and memory card anyways might as well try and get a couple uh get we could have a couple of days of video content as well as well um security for our fields yeah just security for um you know uh identifying you know access control um signages uh areas where we see more frequent um, hunters or trespassers or people that, um, yeah, or things that we um, maybe need to put signage up or talk to um, an individual or talk to a landowner or whatnot. So um, that's always, you know, that's always what's up next. And and land acquisition, um, you know, the these cameras kind of tell the story of why we should be acqu acquiring these lands and why it's important. So um, that's, you know, continuing to, to tell that story and continuing to, continuing to uh, preserve and protect these lands and these corridors for our wildlife um, is, is, is what's, what's, what's the future of our program. And so that, that wraps up my, my presentation. I thank you guys so much. Um, if you guys have any questions or you want to, uh, get involved with our data processing or coming out to do wildlife camera um, maintenance, please email me at chase at river, uh, San Diego river .org. Um, We also have a Critter Cam Facebook page, uh, which is a, a, a private, publicly private um, um, uh, Facebook page group that is just, you know, wildlife and wildlife enthusiasts wildlife conservationists and we share our um, wildlife content within San, the San Diego uh, uh, River watershed. Um, so uh, please, if you guys are on Facebook and uh, tap into that uh, request to, to join the Critter Camp Facebook page. And um, that that's a great way to see a lot more of the content that we're getting from our cameras and also um, other members of the community. So it's, it's, a, it's a real positive um, community group. Uh, and, and yeah, and if you want to get involved with uh, data processing, please email me. We're always looking to add people on. It's a great way to, um, yeah, to, to go through, sort through the photos that we're, we're getting on our lands yourself. And, um, yeah, you never know what you're going to come across. It could be a mountain lion and it could, or it could be a badger or a ringtail cat. You never know. But, uh, yeah, please email me if you have any, um, if you're, you know, with any inquiries on, on that. Um, but yeah, I just want to thank you guys so much for your time. Uh, thank you, Carly, for uh, giving us the platform to talk about our program. And um, yeah, we hope we hope to see you see you out on our preserves and or um, yeah, get get involved with our with our organization. So um, yeah, thank you so much. That's I'll uh, I'm gonna stop there. But if there's any questions or yeah, we can open it up to that. I know we only have two minutes left, but. Yeah. Thank you guys so much, Chase. That was wonderful. Oh my gosh. And I highly suggest you guys check out that Facebook page. It's so amazing to follow and see the different animals that are crossing by. Um, just through your chat, I'm like, okay, should we get those uh, mountain lion people to come and do a talk for us and talk about the mountain lions here? We have had the Mountain Lion Foundation speak before and talk about how important our species are here in San Diego for genetic diversity. So but we do have a, a speaker from the Natural History Museum coming on later this year to talk about rare endangered spe uh, mammal species here in San Diego. So I'm sure they'll talk about that as well. But this was amazing. I really appreciate you guys. Um, everyone really enjoyed it. We did get a question um, from Kristen about our raccoons and if they try to find their way home when they're relocated. Um, Kristen, usually with our young ones that come in, we try to release them all together in a specific site. Um, they might not have any uh, territorial areas quite at that time, but if we do get adult raccoons, we definitely try to release them pretty close to where they're coming back in. But we are so thankful that we've been able to work with the San Diego River Park and release our rehabilitated wildlife back out there to the wild. So it's always, it's a great partnership. Um, and uh, we just can't thank you guys enough for everything you're doing for our local wildlife. It's so important. 
my friends, coexisting is the key. We need these mountain lions, we need the coyotes, all these animals um, are so important to a healthy ecosystem. So I really appreciate you guys spending your Saturday with us. Come back, we do have, uh, next month is going to be a speaker from San Diego Audubon Society talking about bird migrations. I do have Project Coyote coming in on May to talk about uh, coyotes in general and coyotes locally. And I was just able to get um, Raptors are the solution for our June speaking engagement. So they're all about rodenticide use and um, going to talk about the new laws that have been implemented this year in California and what we can do when it comes to coming across bait boxes um, and if they are supposed to be used or not supposed to be used. So I'm working on getting those all up on the website. So keep checking back, but oh my gosh, get nothing but excellent presentation. Thank you all so much. Um, let me see, I think we got all the questions answered um yeah so thanks everyone yes thank you for your expertise and your time robin chase we all really enjoyed it so tune back everyone come back next month to learn about bird migrations and um, have a great weekend everyone enjoy the beautiful weather thanks